Hey, everybody, and welcome to an awesome episode of the Vidor Locksmith Show. We are going to be live here any minute with Fred Dupriest doing the how to maximize ROP through whole cleaning. I am so excited about this episode uh, to be able to put the event out there and have over a thousand people be able to sign up for this is absolutely amazing. Really, 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 really happy about this and everybody being able to uh, take part. I need to stop putting my hands on the desk because it shakes the camera. I've been told not to do that. So uh, first of all, anybody out there that's watching, please let, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, give us a shout out. Let us know who you're working for. If you're a student, what university uh, and what you're studying, let us know. Uh, please let me know. Make sure that the audio and everything is working. If you can hear me, good because we want to be able to make sure we get all of this done right this time if you guys didn't see it there is an episode from last may or june when we did when we first started kicking off the vidor locksmith uh experience definitely had some technical difficulties the first time around with with fred so i think this uh, we've got everything kind of hammered out at least for the most part so we look forward to being able to get this one going really well uh, so we're already up to 91 viewers and we're just here in the first couple of minutes. So we're not going to kick off the class right away. We're going to talk for just a little bit, give everybody that, an, an opportunity to be able to get onto the live stream. I'm going to try to be able to answer as many questions because I know I've got a lot of stuff coming in on LinkedIn, on my phone and everything for all the people that want to be, uh, uh, be able to take part in this. Um, if you didn't check and see on the event, there is the PowerPoint presentation as well as the um, a video on how to be able to, to jump in. We are going to have three videos that will play during the show that we didn't upload, uh, but everything else as far as uh, course materials and stuff, everything's there. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring in Fred uh, and, and at least get the conversation started. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this. Fred, are you there? Can you hear me, sir? Uh, yes, I can. Good, good morning, David. Thank you All for right. having me on the show today. Uh, I don't even think today's, this is not my show by any means today. This is the Fred Dupree show today. I, there are not a thousand people attending an event to, to hear me talk. There are a thousand people wanting to hear you talk and, and be able to educate the industry. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day. And I believe today's Good Friday with all the, the mix of all the days. I, I didn't even realize that that was today. No, absolutely. But uh, uh, this is a pretty good topic. And uh, I think it's one that that, uh, you know, we already sit around and argue about quite a bit is how fast is too fast. So uh, ho hopefully it'll turn out to be a useful day for folks. Well, I do want to say real quick, we've already got 117 people watching. This eclipses our high point for the last one we did with you, which was like 85 real time viewers. So that's good. Uh, so we've got Derek Gorey. Uh, Sarah, uh, Maxime, Tiango, I, I mean, Columbia, Poltivia, Odessa, Pennsylvania, Louisiana, Lafayette. I mean, we've got people watching from all over for this one. So this is, this is really exciting. So I want to start off with a quick question for you. Obviously, uh, a lot's happened in the industry since the last time we spoke. What are your thoughts on the, I guess, the current climate of the industry? And I'm guessing you're probably getting hit up by a lot of people and uh, a, a second layer to that question, are you and Rex still friends? Do you get to call him and ask him his thoughts? <laughs> no, no, I haven't spoken to Rex in quite a, quite a while. Uh, he, uh, I hope he's enjoying his retirement and, uh, and I assume he is and staying healthy. Uh, the, uh, of course, those of us of uh, my age have been through significant downturns a few times, maybe to really, really three very significant turn downturns, and uh, and, men, and they're just painful. Uh, we'll, we'll see, you know, the bumper stickers. You know, please let this be over, and I promise to save money the next time. <laughs> we'll see a lot of the usual things, but for for individuals, it's really a serious situation. I think we just we all need to try to pull together, cut costs, make things profitable, do what we can to uh, to sustain work and jobs uh people companies are having to make decisions about what they think this market is going to do the president is visiting with saudi arabia and russia trying to understand the situation and and what their objectives are and you know data like that that people i don't have but you know many people in industry are looking at who are deciding on investments they're having to decide what they think uh, the duration really of the market condition is going to be 
And, um, and I can't really speculate on that. I, I would say this, you know, if you live through a number of downturns and you just watch the world, I think all of us can see that uh, petroleum is going to continue to dominate. And there's no way that 7 billion people can move away from that. Uh, we have a very inelastic product. Oil, its price drops like a rock when there's too much of it, but it goes through the roof when there's not enough. And we're talking about percentage points, five above, five below in terms of supply. So uh, when you have 7 billion people and today wind and solar are still only producing about, well, less than 5% of the world's energy and no hope of them ever becoming dominant players. That's the reality of the energy that 7 billion people demand. And uh, we, we, when the economies improve, when the demand improves, when we come back on balance, the price will go up. We just don't know when that's going to be. Oh. So quick question. Do you think that it's possible for either processes or technical innovation uh, here within U.S. land to be able to drive down costs enough to be able to compete with some of the other low cost producers in the world? I think the our unconventional industry in general has become uh, um, really over the last three or four years, they've just continued to make improvements in performance. And from a drilling perspective, and drill time is a big part of those costs, it's put more weight on a bit. That's how we think of it in limited redesign terms. It's drill faster. And when something limits you, you do something about it. Then you put more weight on a bit and you drill faster. It's very simple. So it's not so simple to go do, but when you when you look at the continual redesign of what limits us, it's broad spread. Some companies have really led, uh, but there um, uh, others have followed pretty quickly. So I think we've become a fast drilling industry. How much is left on the table? Ten to twenty percent. There's much more on the table in terms of fracking costs, uh, recovery efficiencies, uh, probably in that area. But what we uh, can do still is in terms of drilling costs is, is really financially quite significant when you're looking at rates of return and how highly leveraged it is when you reduce your cost a little bit. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's plenty left to be done and practices vary enormously between the operators that I see. There are operators that are uniformly 30% faster, which means the other operators could become 30% faster. And it's important to uh, to continue to understand physically how things work, understand your limiters, be organized about it, and continue to redesign those. And, and you tend to end up in the same place over time. Excellent. So one more question before we jump into the class. I think we're, we're kind of plateauing out as far as people joining in to, to watch live. We're already at 156. So this is the most popular Vitor Locksmith episode ever already. Um, so one thing that I've been thinking about, and this kind of goes back to one of the questions I asked you the last time we were together, um, was about geothermal. So I know that you and Sam had done, a, a, or at least bid on a you know, kind of like a government project work and where you'd said that, you know, essentially drilling on geothermal is one to one with drilling for hydrocarbons. Now that, you know, the industry is kind of going through a downturn, is this the chance for geothermal to be able to make a strike and obviously not overtake oil and gas, but to be become a little bit more prominent because now that, you know, rig prices, personnel and services are a little bit cheaper. Uh, unfortunately, the mechanics of the downturn are cheap energy, low oil prices. So geothermal has got more problems today than it had a year ago, because ultimately it has to com either compete or the federal government has to greatly increase the uh, uh, subsidy, uh, okay. which it already benefits from quite a bit. <laughs> so the, the government, you know, is we're, <laughs> we're just, picked up another $2.5 trillion in debt that we're borrowing from our children that we have absolutely no intention of ever paying back. There's a whole, there's a whole range of emotions and ideas around all of that, but I don't see more money being out there for more government money be out there for research or support for programs right now that don't already make some money to start with. Okay. Uh, the geothermal has enormous opportunities to improve performance. But it's a very, very tiny industry, very small industry in the U.S. It's quite large in the Pacific Rim with 
a lot of geothermal resource. But um, uh, it depends on where, where you're at. Uh, it, it does definitely make money where it makes money. But in, in the U.S., if we're really you know, being U.S. centric here, then uh, it's, it's going to continue to be very challenged. Mm. I was hoping for a bright spot there for a lot of the people in the industry that it might you know be you know unfortunately having to move on from positions that they've had for quite some time and thinking you know where else can we take these 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 skill sets these products these services to you know and, and be able to you know do that kind of one to one transfer and so that's why I was asking you because obviously it's not an area I've got a lot of expertise in I think a lot of our viewers probably don't have an expertise in that area but you know obviously you know given the current situation all options are kind of on the table uh, as far as looking at things so i will say this if anybody out there is watching please uh tag a friend uh invite a friend to to join um or um uh, at least just comment like i said let us know where you're watching from uh we've got adam uh from trinidad uh frank saying hello to somebody we've got uh kurt M. Brewster uh, and Ian McCourt. I believe Ian McCourt, that's my old boss. He's watching. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining in. We're at 172. Wow, this is absolutely amazing. So what I'm going to do is, uh, Fred, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. We'll get this thing rolling. For everybody that's watching, they can hear this right now. Uh, guys, as we go through this, if you guys have any questions, I'm going to be monitoring the comment section on LinkedIn as close as I can, being able to if I can answer anything, answer it. I know it's probably completely out of my scope to be able to answer it. It'll probably be more of just technical stuff as far as the live stream is concerned, not any of the questions or anything that uh, Fred's teaching. I'm going to try to answer as many questions as I can. If you do have a question for Fred, um, let us know and we'll try to bring it in. We're, we won't stop every time we get a question, but if we, if we get something good or if we see like a, a consistent trend as far as questions are concerned, I'll jump in. We'll we'll pause for it and we'll we'll ask the question uh, as we go along. We want this. The whole reason this is live is because we want this to be as interactive as possible. We want you guys to be able to get as much value from this as possible, uh, so that we can all kind of walk away having learned something. Uh, and then at the end, we'll do some more Q and A. So if you guys have got some other um, drilling related questions outside of hole clean that you want to be able to ask, kind of like what we did with the last episode, feel free to 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 shoot those my way either on my phone. Uh, the Vidor locksmith at gmail.com if you want to stay anonymous or ask them in the the, the comment section on LinkedIn. I'm going to try to keep a, a rolling tab of all the questions that come through while we're doing the lessons. So without any uh, without any further ado, Fred, the, the stage is yours, please, sir. And uh, thank you so much for doing this. We, we all do appreciate this very much. Uh, my pleasure, David. Let's see if we can get my screen uh, shared here. Go. You can see that. Okay. Yes, sir. And then my so, audio will cut out when I come off screen here. So, okay, very good. All you, sir. So the subject, you know, is is how fast. In some sense, we're saying how fast is too fast. Uh, that that's really what we're talking about when we 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 go through our typical, you know, limiter redesign physics based process. We put more weight on bit. We drill faster. We get this linear relationship. And drilling faster is pretty dang easy. You just keep raising weight on bit as long as the bit's efficient. And if the bit's not becomes inefficient, well, we kind of know the causes of that. We've got physics, we've got operating practices, we've got engineering redesign to extend the weight on bit at which we then have a, some limitation. Well, that's just the basic dogma. And if we just keep redesigning what limits us, we end up going very fast. I would say, that this is limit being limited by the bit or some kind of bit dysfunction, but really globally, probably, I, I don't know, 70, 80, 70% maybe of our footage is not limited by the bit developing a problem, but by a non bit limitation. If you're offshore and extended reach, you know, it might be your geologist is just saying you can't drill faster than 200 feet an hour. Or I can't, I can't uh, get the data I need. Uh, there, I've probably worked on 30 or 40 different non-bit limiters. If you just continue to redesign and redesign so that you can apply more weight on bit, eventually somewhere you're going to end up at hole cleaning. But unlike these other items where I can say, well, my drill string torque at this weight on bit and all this bit torque is, and this extended reach equals my string makeup and I have to quit. 
well, unlike something specific like that, we tend to not really have a strong sense of exactly how much is too much when it comes to hole cleaning. We go with prior practice or maybe one event, one stuck pipe event happened, maybe two in the program, and they were at a certain ROP, and we say, well, you know, that seems like that was too much. If we understand the physics of hole cleaning, uh, we realize immediately that um, one well is not much different than another. And if one can go very fast, they all should be able to. When we do have a problem with stuck pipe, there's a specific issue, just like a specific bit dysfunction. There's a specific borehole dysfunction that's causing it, and we can fix that. Now we can go pretty dang fast. So companies I've worked with that have gone through this iteration of taking care of this limiter, that limiter, that limiter, they end up pretty fast. And, and you see some pretty uh, remarkable, what I would have thought were remarkable numbers at one time. Uh, I've been involved in operations that have drilled 2,000 feet per hour in a 70 and a half inch surface hole, continuous, steady 2,000 feet per hour with very little circulation on connections, 1,000, 1,500 feet per hour. How can they do that? And how can another well maybe not be able to do that? As long as I have a normal fluid, you know, some lightweight fluid with a little bit of gel strength, uh, it turns out I can go very, very fast. Uh, I had friends years ago that worked Lake Maracaibo in the 1970s, and they made 10,000 foot days in the 1970s with their roller comb bit and didn't get packed off. So just empirically, if we look around, we know that, that, that there's some physics here that we can understand and work with. I'm going to cut to the end of the story here and say that if you have an enlarged hole, if you allow your hole to become enlarged due to borehole instability, mostly, you are going to be limited. And if you don't, it's unlikely that hole cleaning will ever be your limitation. And the point is not that, you know, if I have a borehole instability, I, I'm going to be limited. It's that if you don't allow borehole instability, you are almost never limited by hole cleaning. You're almost, I, I would say unlimited, but in reality, you'll run out of drill string torque, motor differential. Something else is going to keep you from going faster. So that's the bottom line. And that's, that's where we're headed. It's my last slide is, is, is drill a gauge hole. And we drill a gauge hole by raising the mud weight, which, you know, you say, well, I'm, I'm limited by hole cleaning. What should I do? Raise the mud weight. Most people would say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Um, I can't transport the cuttings. Or am I trying to float them out of the hole? No, you're trying to keep the hole gauge. And, and that's the big takeaway here. Now, I need to build that case for you. And I'm, that's what I'm going to do with these slides that we're going to go through here. Hole cleaning. There's not really such a thing as a hole cleaning limiter. There's borehole instability. And if you take care of that, we, 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 uh, we can do some pretty amazing things. And we'll, we'll build that case here. So we typically divide our physics into low angle, intermediate angles, and high angle. Low is less than 40 degrees. And in that kind of inclinations, we're lifting cuttings out of the hole. We're generating these cuttings. <clears throat> As the fluid flows north, the cutting is settling within that fluid. The rate at which it's settling relative to the fluid it's traveling in, we call the slip rate. If the slip rate is, is greater than the flow rate, the cutting actually isn't moving at all. If there's a slight difference, the cutting is moving very slowly. In a perfect world, we would like the cutting to travel at the same velocity as our fluid. And, and you know that. When you're approaching that, if you get bottoms up, literally get your cuttings up from bottom uh, in one bottom volumes of uh, bottoms up. If you if it takes one and a half volumes, then your cuttings probably traveling, you know, slipping at about a third the rate of your upward motion. Or you could do the math on those things. So those holes that I showed you, they're drilling 1,500 feet an hour. They they they're telling us something. They're telling us they are gauge holes. What happens in a non-gauge hole is that when the cuttings in the fluid arrive at that enlarged hole, they slow down. Their slip rate is the same. That's the size of the cutting, the fluid properties, and gravity. 
slip rate doesn't change, but the upward velocity of the fluid around them does. And now suddenly, perhaps my slip rate exceeds my flow rate, and the and or or my um, and my particle is falling. Or in that enlarged hole, maybe slip rate equals flow rate, and the particle goes into the enlargement, but it can't make it out the top, so the cuttings concentrate, and that eventually leads to a pack off. Uh, there's nothing you know that's more important. We've got we've got the fluid velocities, we've got the flow rate, you know, that we're pumping at, um, which gets overwhelmed if the hole is very enlarged at all. It, you know, the velocity drops so much for any practical pump rate we can drill with. Uh, we've got buoyancy, which is pretty big. If you've got a if you've got an 18 and a half pound mud, almost all shells are virtually floating out of the hole. Uh, Lesser mud weights, I get less help from buoyancy. Those change my slip rate, but we don't get to design this. You know, our, our mud weights tend to be minimized all the time that we can. So it, it's not really a design option. Flow rate doesn't tend to be a design option. You're going to drill your 12 and a quarter holes at rates that are really kind of probably related to your rig system and, um, and some other issues. Uh, what we can design and control is whether we let the hole enlarge or not. And we can do it at very low cost with very little effort. So we're going to keep coming back to that. So what I've got here, I'm going to show you a few movies. Movies. I've got this kind of apparatus that I use in class to uh, explain how uh, cuttings transport and the effects of enlarged hole. I've got an air pump, mattress air pump, sitting on the floor down here with a hose coming up to this valve. I can use the valve to control the flow rate through my gauge hole and my enlarged hole, and then it goes back to gauge hole, and this thing's about 10 feet long. I also have the ability to introduce cuttings into that flow stream. I've got a valve that I can use here to control the rate at which I feed cuttings to the bottom of the hole. So I'm simulating both the drill rate and the flow rate in this little simple model. And by the way, it's called lizard dirt in a, at Petco. On a drilling rig, it's called 400 micron nut holes. You would not believe what they charge for 400 micron nut holes in Petco. Apparently, it's just, you know, the thing for lizards anyway. So I'm using a lightweight material here and air. I've been involved and have seen quite a, quite a bit of research and videos, full scale videos, full scale clear plexiglass drilling with drill pipe inside, maybe turning 120 to 160 RPM. Everything I'm gonna show you here is no different in an actual full scale, 90 foot long stand of pipe that, that there was a lot of flexibility in testing all kinds of things. And you could sit there and watch those cutting bed and you're gonna see the same things uh, for the most part in these little videos that you would if you spent, you know, $10 million to go get the data. Okay. So if you would show the, the video number three there, if you could start that for me, David, I'll, I'll kind of walk through this and I'll, I'll tell you when to stop and start. Okay, David, I can't see probably what you're seeing. Let me back out of this and see. So just see the uh, the screen that uh, where you can see the two of us. Okay, I'm going to go back to that screen. Very good. You see it? So what I've done is I've taken this enlarged section and turned it vertically. You know, bent, bent the tube up vertically. So the cuttings are coming into the gauge hole <laughs> and they're rising. And what you're going to see here is that as they, as they enter the enlarged hole, which is about equivalent to an eight and a half hole going to a 12 and a quarter hole size, not a big enlargement. What you're going to see. Oh, sorry. I can talk, no, I can talk through this before you run okay. it. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry. You, just, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just tell me what you want me to hit play. Sorry. Yeah. I, so you're going to see the cuttings arrive, but very few cuttings come out. And what's happening is that the slip velocity is greater than the flow rate. It was fine down in the gauge hole. As it crowds up, uh, well, go ahead and run the, the video there, David, if you would.
So as it concentrates, you know, what you can see is it starts to kind of gurgle. There's so much cuttings and I have power so I can push through them. As I do that, I punch a small flow area through the middle of that mass. The velocity goes up right in the core. So that lets me lift pieces of the cuttings out. Uh, stop. So it's gurgling up. I get some out of that, but what you would see in real life on your rig, you just see pressure spikes or some general broad increase, a few hundred PSI in pressure, maybe a uh, hundred PSI uh, as you circulate the well uh, due to this extra force required to push these things out of the hole. My, my basic in that hole size, my basic slip rate exceeds my flow rate until it gets crowded. And then I'm really punching through the middle. So now, Slip rate is less than flow rate. Uh, if you could go back to the end there, David, of that okay. video. Right there. So what I did right there at the very end was I turned the pump off. What happens whenever we uh, are drilling and we have an enlarged hole is that we actually don't really see very much. Maybe a little bit of pressure spiking. Stop right there and hold it. When we, it's only when we turn our pumps off that the really bad things happen because it all falls around our drill string and it bridges off uh, across the hole. So now what I may see, what your diagnostics would be that you have not a hole cleaning problem, but a hole enlargement problem is that when you bring your pumps back on, you'll see extra pressure required to get started. Uh, but it'll free up. You're pushing on the bottom. This isn't uh, unless you pressure energize and wedge lock these things against the borehole wall, they don't have any strength. You're just going to fluff them and lift them and go back to drilling. So you might see a little pressure on connections. You might see a little drag. If you, if you bring your pump rate on, say really fast, you might pressure energize it, wedge lock it into the borehole wall, and now it's got strength and now you're actually stuck. But most of our drillers are pretty good about their practices, bringing things on slowly. So, that's not the most likely thing to see. The other diagnostic you'll see is that you'll trip out of hole and you'll come back in with casing or whatever and you find a bridge. That's not a hole cleaning indicator. That is a borehole instability enlarged hole indicator. And that's the way you, you should think about it. You don't want your primary response to be to circulate longer before you come out of the hole because you're not going to clean this enlarged one out. The slip rate's greater than, than the, than the uh, flow rate. You could pump some sweeps and do some good, but you're burning rig time and you still don't know that you're getting this clean, especially if they're cavings that are somewhat larger. They're just tumbling around in here and you may still find your bridge and it's really costly or rerun casing. So if we think of this as a hole enlargement problem, we probably are going to do the right thing, which is raise the mud weight, in a few rare cases, run an inhib more inhibited fluid, but most of our instability and our unconventionals with, uh, and most of our programs now, whether it's an unconventional or high angle offshore extended reach well, it, it's, it's really stress induced due to inadequate mud weight and not um, chemically induced. We don't necessarily need a different fluid because when we do need a different fluid, we're just pretty good about doing that. We're really bad about running the mud weight required drill gauge hole because we don't really understand all the value if we're either if we're not getting stuck and have high npt if we're just slow drilling in an extended reach well because we see pack offs when they go faster we're just not thinking about that as an instability problem and tweaking the mud weight you know three tenths of a pound per gallon might make it go away we think of it as well i just can't drill faster than that that's as fast as i can clean the hole OK, so bridging is is really a, a uh, uh, we might get stuck on a connection or we might see bridging. All of those are indicators of hole enlargement. And that's the way we ought to think about them, not as a hole cleaning. OK, let me jump back to the PowerPoint here, David. Yes, sir. And then I will exit Steve. OK, you'll be back soon. Uh, so I, I hope that I hope that makes sense, and and I hope that as you drill, you know you'll you see things. You'll try to see if you can put that back into that kind of framework, uh, that kind of way of thinking about what's going on. We see bridges, uh, we may see pack offs on connections, 
And another kind of peculiar related thing is actually gumbo attacks. When we're drilling a really reactive clay, that those cuttings are initially separated by a lot of fluid. And I can't really get a gumbo pack off and let those cuttings get together somewhere. <clears throat> they don't naturally do that. They're spaced out by fluid. They're all slipping at about the same rate. So yeah, they're slipping down in this vertical flowing calling, but they're slipping at the same rate. So they maintain their separation. It is in the enlarged areas here where they come in and don't go out, where they get together. And they're ionically active, one touches the other, the Van de Waals things happen and they grab onto each other. And now I've got a solid plug and I eventually hydraulically seal the annulus and then it just flows out as a plug, hits my bell nipple and, and flow lines and now here we go. <clears throat> I've actually drilled in severe gumbo areas where we did not dilute our way through the problem that like we usually do because we were in a marsh and had to work out of steel tanks. We ran very high gel strength mud and eliminated the gumbo pack off problem. Keep them separated. Generally speaking, in a vertical hole, uh, we don't need very much yield point, six RPM reading to drill with, with flow rate. Where what we do to address the settling that occurs on connections is what we call gel strength or perhaps six RPM reading. That is the degree to which all the particles link up to each other ionically when, when we stop breaking their gels and let them sit for a second. We need gel strength. Focus on gel strength. Uh, focus on raising your mud weight, but if you can't get the whole gauge, the next thing to do is focus on suspension when you're not flowing. Those wells that drill 1,500 feet an hour drill with water, no suspension. You just circulate about a minute to get it all above your BHA and shut down and let it fall. As long as it falls and doesn't reach your BHA and it's all falling at the same rate, you retain your separation. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of preaching some heresy here, and I don't exactly want to do that. We always need to maintain properties, if we can, that are kind of in the ballpark of what we've already been taught. If I can't manage my instability, though, the thing I'm going to press for is gel strength. All right, high angle holes work differently. The physics is just different uh, in some ways. In this case, I'm being pushed sideways by flow rate, not upward. Nothing is pushing upward and gravity is pulling me down. Well, buoyancy, the net effect of buoyancy and gravity is down unless I've got an 18.5 mud weight. So I've got a thing pushing me down and a thing pushing me sideways and my two vectors end up on a path like this, I will hit bottom. And that once I hit bottom, there's nothing to pick me up again. I can only be pushed on from the side. So I'm going to hit bottom. So typically our cuttings come off the top of the drill collars or BHA where we have a pretty high velocity. And hey Fred, and, I got a quick question from the audience real quick. Yeah. I'm trying to get these in there. Sorry, everybody who is watching this. I've seen a couple go by and I'm trying to manage this. So Katie Mills, a drilling engineer over at ConocoPhillips says, what about situations in which we cannot raise the mud weight, depleted zones, et cetera? Are we just always ROP limited? The, Thank you, Katie, you know, for the question. That, that's that's a, a, a really a good question. Um, what limits you? In that situation, what limits you? If it's the it's the initiation of lost returns, then let's say that's our limiter. Let's not say hole cleaning is our limiter because we can do things about the initiation of lost returns. If it's a high angle extended reach well, you probably isn't your mud weight that's initiating that. It's your ECD. That might be two pounds per gallon. I can, I can actually go to managed pressure drilling and add two pounds per gallon of stability mud weight or maybe a pound and a half per gallon. And that's going to stabilize almost any situation. If they're survivable to begin with, it's going to be probably about perfect once I do that. So, so if I treat it, if I say my limiter is, is hole cleaning, I do nothing. I probably reduce my flow rate to avoid losing returns. And that's certainly not what we want to do. But if I say my limiter is lost returns, I might be able to find some solutions. If, um, if you've got a depleted sand and you've exposed that and that's your problem, 
there's another paper on that. You know, it's, you do an FCS squeeze, you stop, you do a proper FCS squeeze, you stress it up to its original integrity, and then you do whatever you want to. It's got as much integrity as the shell all around it. So, uh, or, or if, um, or you might use a stress building fluid, a so-called stress cage or uh, fluid. Uh, we have options as long as we think about it as a lost returns problem and not as a root cause and not a whole cleaning problem. Uh, that may or may not help you in your given situation. The sprayberry, for example, out in in uh, uh, Midland, uh, there is actually a stress regression that happens there in the background rock as you go deeper. Uh, your integrity of the borehole is basically how much stress you have holding it closed. And if you have a stress regression, meaning H min is going down, then and you're stress holding the hole closed has gotten down to 9.2 pound per gallon you're just not going to be able to put more 9.2 on the hole so that's a that's a pretty difficult situation if it's in the sand and you lose you might be able to stress it up a little bit but if it's an impermeable shell where that's happened lcms don't work in shells we don't have any answers that work to stress up a shell so you, you're really getting into a very uh big you know as we all know a big and contentious area of discussion around how to manage holistically and logistically the lost return scenario in a given well, but that's what I would focus on. Uh, Thank generally, Thank generally in, in land wells, in the unconventionals, uh, a lot of our losses are difficult to treat. In high angle extended reach wells that are largely due to ECD and managed pressure drilling can, can work that. And then the third big scenario that's we don't have as much of anymore as we're, de we're penetrating all depleted sands and we can stress those back up that with high, high degree of success uh, pretty much every time. All right. Thank you, Brandon. I'll jump back off and let you go back. Really, really important question. It, it's true of everything. You know, what limits you? Well, I can't, I can't pump any faster. I'm out of pumps. Well, you know, can we go get more pumps? So it, it's kind of a general state of mind. Make sure that we're asking kind of the five whys and getting down to what our actual root limiter is. If your boss lacks knowledge, that's your limiter, folks. So think real broadly about what you need to do to enable yourself to put more weight on bed. So we have this particle that lands on bottom. And what, what happens is that if I don't have enough velocity pushing sideways on it to make it roll, there's nothing picking it up all the best I can do is make it roll. If I can't make it roll, then it just sits there and my bed height gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Now, as the bed height gets deeper and deeper, the flow area above it is going down. So what's happening to the velocity there? Well, I'm still pumping at the same rate. So my velocity is going up pretty dramatically for every little bit of, of bed that I build. At some point, I am gonna be able to roll that cutting because the velocity is so high. And as soon as I'm able to roll the top of the bed, as soon as the flow area is small enough and the velocity high enough that I can roll the top of the bed, they start rolling and my bed quits growing. We call that height the equilibrium bed height. There's no such thing as a clean hole. So if you think about it, when we go around saying, you know, we need better hole cleaning, we need to keep the hole clean, well, okay, that's zero ROP. Because zero ROP is the only time that you have a clean hole. You sit there and, and even then you've got to have a velocity so that your equilibrium bed height is basically zero, which may not, which rarely the case in an, in an extended reach well, for example. So zero, I mean, uh, the, the hole is not clean. In some ways that language doesn't make any sense, particularly when our objective is to drill faster. The actual objective is to drill with the dirtiest hole possible. And it's really important to say those words out loud every now and then to yourself because the physics of the dirtiest hole possible, mechanically what happens when your hole is really loaded up and has a very high equilibrium height, the physics of that is different than the physics of getting everything out of the hole. And, and it really it really starts to influence how you what you monitor, how how sensitive how concerned you are about things like enlarged hole okay 
So pi protation helps. What it tends to do is just reduce the equilibrium bed height and tilt it a little bit to the right. It we don't we would be improper to say pipe rotation cleans the hole. Pipe rotation reduces the equilibrium bed height. That's what it does. Now you might have a scenario where your equilibrium bed is already very very low down here, and now when I rotate it reduces it to zero. Well, I guess in that specific kind of case you could say it cleaned the hole but it's not really the right way to think about pipe rotation it it changes the equilibrium height you can also have a situation if you're pumping 700 gallons a minute 750 in an eight and a half hole in the delaware basin you probably have a zero bed height to start with the velocity around the annulus around your drill pop is probably high enough that this equilibrium bed height is close to zero. At 450 gallons, no. At 550, I don't know. At 650, I still don't know. So we don't really ever know whether we have an equilibrium bed sitting there or not. But within the normal flow rates and ranges of flow that we use in our operations around the world, uh, there is an equilibrium bed, I think, in a great deal of the footage. Okay, so we're going to have an equilibrium bed. It's going to have material down here that doesn't move at all, and it's going to have material on top that's actually rolling along. Now, what does an enlarged hole do then? Why is that so critical? Well, first of all, this is kind of self limiting. As the bed height grows, the velocity in a gauge hole goes up. So it's really harder and harder for the bed height to even grow. I get a thicker layer of material that's actually moving, but I don't get a taller base bed. And even that material that's moving tends to move faster and more efficiently. It's really hard to pack off. It's almost self-limiting. And what happens then, you know, if you compare a gauge to where we're going to fill up to this critical flow area, and, and really it's more appropriate to say we have an equilibrium flow area than an equilibrium bed height more language that's confusing. I'm going to flow, fill the big hole until I have the same equilibrium flow area. Because at that area, I have the critical velocity where I can now start to roll cavings. Anything less than that area, I don't have enough velocity to roll cuttings rather. I don't have enough velocity to roll what's on top of my equilibrium bed. So big hole, fills up to the same flow area, not the same bed height. And if you do the math on that cross-sectional area, one of those compared to the other, as far as the cross-section of the bed itself, there's a lot more cuttings in that big hole than there is that small hole. Ultimately, the reason that's a problem is that this stored mass here is so great that if I do anything that destabilizes that, energizes it, disturbs it, even a small percentage of this being disturbed won't fit in the gauge hole above, and then we pack off. In full-scale testing, you'll literally, you'll literally actually see the flow come across to this. Geometrically, it has to come down, and you'll see a little dip in it, and then you'll see a hump out here. Uh, that, that kind of just all wedge locks if you take a whole bunch of this at one time and try to drive it down into here. Um, so our problem with the big hole is that it's going to always have a large stored mass in it. And that large stored mass is really sensitive or, or pack offs occur really easily if I do anything that mobilizes even a small part of that. So I just bring my pump rates on too fast. And I get this pressure wave that comes through here and drives in here and picks up a bunch of this and packs me off. Whereas that same pressure wave traveling in a gauge hole takes that same percentage of material, kind of waves it up, but nothing bad happens. The stored mass here is too great. Nope, that makes sense. Now, it's sensitive to changes in pump rate, you know, a little bit, but the big thing is I don't typically actually have a problem with enlarged hole, the cavings in it, but mostly it's cuttings in it. I don't really have a problem until I try to trip. 
and my top of my drill collars or my first stabilizer, if we pull into these enlargements, is going to mechanically drive this into the top of the hole. As soon as this hits the top of the hole and we pull a little bit more, we're wedge locking it. We're, what we're, we say we're increasing the effective stress, which creates strength. And now we're stuck. And so you can see the problem of ever getting a BHA through an area with a lot of stored mass. It doesn't take very much um, to drive it into the top of the hole. So rapid changes of pump rate. I mean, Fred, we're looking. Fred, yeah, go, go ahead. Question. So we we've had we've had a dozen questions come in uh, during this part. So I'm going to try to fire off a couple right quick. Um, somebody asked the meaning of the 120 RPM rule of thumb is paradigm. Uh, also, we had the question of what downhole technologies and or measurements can help indicate help indicate hole cleaning and effectiveness. The the uh, the 120. Uh, first of all, there's been two decades of research on pop RPM, probably more than that. Uh, what there there is no rule of thumb that applies broadly. The physics don't support that. So, for example, if I have five and a half drill pipe, you know, an eight and a half hole, 100 RPM does an awful lot more than five and a half drill pipe in a 17 and a half inch horizontal hole. I mean, just logically, you know, it's disturbing that annulus area a great deal more. Um, so there is no. Uh, the, the reason that we have the 100 and, and, I, and I agree as a general rule of thumb, 120 is good. But the reason we have that is because we just need a number. We can't sit and teach everybody maybe this level of conversation we're having right here. Um, 120 is better than 100. 100 is better than 80. 80 is better than 60. 160 is better than 120. So there are diminishing rates of return, but there's no specific physics that point, in my, in my, to my knowledge, directly at 120. It's also the upper end of what I can spin a bent motor at. Uh, and, and in reality, you're probably not going to spin it that fast unless you have a pretty small bend in it. Which goes back to one of the other topics you've talked about, which is running a lower bend angle motor. Yeah, we, we need lower bend motors for all kinds of drilling mechanics reasons. Quarrel is uh, the cause of most all failure. Bits, BHAs, motors, LWD, electronics. And you put a big old bend in there and spin it, then you're just making life hard. Um, so that, that's a long, it's another long conversation, but- low yeah, I don't want to distract you. I don't want to distract you because I know we can talk about that one for a while. But, but the thing about the RPM is I, I would say that for, uh, I, do, I do four times more good with more GPM than I do more RPM. Uh, and that would be my belief, uh, and maybe informed a little bit by some testing that I've seen. So I'm not very obsessed with 120. In fact, as I teach class, I'm really obsessed with whirl. What if 120 is the resonant speed of your BHA? You're absolutely destroying your BHA by trying to follow some pole cleaning hog law. What we want to do is, is, and it's a priority, you know, is teach whirl and how to manage it in real time, how to identify, do RPM step test, identify when you're at a resonant RPM and forget your whole cleaning priorities. Your number one priority is not be at one of those resonant RPMs. So maybe you def you identify one at uh, the resonant at 80 and your resonant again at 100, not at 120, fine, do 120. But if you're resonant at 120, I'd rather be at 80 than that. So, uh, Part of our workflow for hole cleaning is how we choose our RPM to do that. And part of how we choose our RPM has to be a process for identifying resonant speeds. Excellent. And then the other question was, and I know this will probably be a little bit quicker so we can go back to the, the thing. What downhole technologies and or measurements can indicate hole cleaning effectiveness? Uh, a PWD. Uh, to me, that's that would be the primary tool. And so, what I'm looking for is the is the back pressure, um, and then I'm also using that possibly to establish practices for how 
how fast I bring my pumps on, um, for, for looking at, um, uh, uh, unusual changes in how much back pressure I have in the anus, which probably reflect the development of an enlarged hole and so, a high okay. storage capacity with resistance. Uh, or the, it might reflect that. So from the, the MWD side, my question then would be, um, at what sample rate and at what um, resolution do we need to be able to get that data to where it can be effective either in real time? So there's the real time, obviously, and then the, you know, uh, uh, recorded mode, being able to look at it after the fact. Uh, how much value do you think we can get in real time? And then how much value can we get in after the fact as far as? Yeah, I don't I don't see I don't data. see any research really with numbers that quantify that it's a really good question but an operations driller sitting on the rig will figure a lot of that out um, and could tell you it depends on the scenario that you're looking at if you're in a vertical well and you've got an enlarged hole and it's crowding up uh, I, that vertical hole by the way I really like <clears throat> and I quote him all the time uh, uh, Eric Van Ort over at UT calls it uh, the Hotel California the, the cuttings check in and they never check out it's a pretty good way to visualize it. If your cuttings are checking in and they're not checking out, you're going to see more back pressure that will develop slowly. So I don't need a very high data rate to see that. If you're trying to react instantly to an actual pack off event, I would say um, I haven't seen data on how quickly what you're saying is how quickly does a pack off get pressure energized by my pump pressure to have enough strength that I can no longer boom my pipe. That's a whole segue of things. And I suspect it's several seconds, if not a little bit longer. And, but I don't know that. Uh, I can envision some pack offs may happen in two seconds and you're really not going to see that react uh, and react, you know, shut your pumps down and drop your string down to loosen up the pack off. Uh, some pack offs may actually build for a period of time. Good question. And I, and I don't really know the answer. All right. Thanks for we'll you, you, you could you could actually logic your way through some of that to set up some field trials and some research though. Um, that would be a thought. Well, there we go. If anybody wants to uh, send some money away of Texas A&M and Fred Dupree, yeah. just and tell your folks that you plan to go pack off and get stuck and measure how long it takes. And <laughs> man, we're right there with you. <laughs> thanks, Fred. I'll let you go back. <laughs> okay. So if you'll run this video here and I, I think this is the number one video there, David. All right, I'm back. Okay, uh, let me see here. I'll get it queued up in just a second. Stop that. So this is uh, the, the, the same apparatus with the uh, extended reach well on the end of it. That's our shell shakers down there where we recover these nut holes. So anyway, what we're going to start feeding, we're going to start drilling with a clean borehole theoretically. And let's watch this, what this bed behavior is. Cuttings come out and they hit bottom. And they continue to build, the height continues to build right here where I'm pointing there until it reaches the equilibrium bed height. You notice downstream of that, the cuttings are stopping. Certainly when they get to the big hole, they're, they're dead stopped. Now, what happens over time here, literally in a real well, if we had a clean hole, we'd be bothered to truly clean it out and go back to drilling after a trip, is we have to rebuild our equilibrium bed all the way from the bit back to the curve before we get anything out of the hole. Likewise, if I have an enlarged section, we'll build that equilibrium bed all the way to the enlarged section where nothing's going to get past. And then we'll start building bed height in the enlarged section with very little uh, getting past that. And what you're going to see here over time is that the bed in the enlarged section here will actually grow uh, considerably higher than in, than in the gauge. Well, that makes sense uh, based on what we've, we've talked about. It should grow until the open area above the bed in the, in the enlarged hole is the same as the open area above the bed there to the left of that. Let's watch. I'm eventually going to increase the drill rate here so we, we can get there a little bit quicker. 
Now, at the same time, I have in Lawrence Hall, it, it, it may have cavings in it. The early cavings that come off the hole are probably going to be carried out. But once it's enlarged, I sure enough have trouble uh, getting big stuff to travel out of it. So I'll have a combination in real world of some maybe larger uh, popping shell cavings uh, with these cuttings. If I went in and I, and I took the trouble to clean all this out, key point, it's worthless. I go back to drilling and this is going to fill back exactly back to the same equaler and bed height in the enlargement that I'm about to create right now. Even within that enlargement there, you see it builds to the equilibrium height at the early part of the enlargement. And it takes a while to actually fill it all the way to the end because the stuff to the right is still moving out until the bed height gets to the equilibrium for the enlargement. So these things refill almost instantly. And if you want to manage it, again, raise your mud weight and don't allow it to happen in the first place. Because from if you allow it to happen from now on, this is what you're fooling around with here. Now I'm starting to get some material out of that. Um, because I've reached the equilibrium bed within the enlarged area. And that's the end of the video there. Okay. Uh, so there's some implications here. Um, there's no such thing as a clean hole, number one. Look at the gauge hole there. You don't really care. It's not bothering you. Leave it alone. Just keep drilling. The faster you drill, that equilibrium height will stay about the same, but you'll have a thicker transportable layer on top. Uh, the other is that that gauge hole is not a problem. It's, it really self-regulates. The stored mass that you're worried, what you're worried about is the stored mass that can exist in the enlarged hole and will absolutely be certain to exist. Okay, so I think there's another video. Uh, is the next slide also a video? Uh, here's the. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. I mean, the next uh, movie, excuse me. Yes, sir. What number is that one? I think we said two. That's it. Uh, uh, that's it. Number two, okay. I think. Okay, hold on. It's a real short video, so I need you to stop it pretty quick here once it starts. Does that look right, Fred? Uh, yeah. Okay, stop. Oops. Now, so watch the bottom of the beds here and here. That's my equilibrium bed down here. This top part is the transportable layer. That bottom is never moving, never, ever, ever, ever. It's just going to be there. The only way I can get, and, and if I stop, and what we're going to do here is stop drilling in a minute <clears throat> and just circulate. And what you're going to see is the top will come off because it's actually sticking up above the equilibrium height where I, I can roll things and can't roll things. What can be rolled will roll. So <clears throat> it'll come out of the hole, but that doesn't mean your hole is clean. So if you go ahead there, David. All right, now I've stopped drilling and we're just circulating to see what happens. There's very little, fear for a minute, there's a little bit more, there's no motion above the big hole. The big hole is kind of cleaning out a little bit. It's gonna stop and about right, about right here, there's no more coming out of the big hole. We're still pumping, still pumping on that and you can't even hardly see a grain moving anywhere. So that is the equilibrium bed height at which the force cannot roll the material. And in a drilling fluid and full scale lab testing, this, this is what you see. It, this is real. Even with drill pipe rotation. And uh, I've seen a video with a pipe turning, I think 160 RPM inside a bed that's high like that. And the bed is barely bobbling. Equilibrium bed height went down when the pipe rotation was turned on. But the base equilibrium bed was barely moving. Pipe just spins inside of it. So the implication here is, is that when you trip, 
First of all, if you're just going for a motor or a bit, leave the base bed alone. It's not hurting you. You do want to circulate bottoms up before you trip to remove all of that transportable layer. The faster you've been drilling, the thicker that transportable layer is going to be. You need the bed height cross-sectional area to be less than the flow area around your bit and your stabilizers, maybe about 10%. If you can do that, you can pull your stabilizers and bit easily through all of that bed. It just flows up. It's, it's not strong. It has no strength. It's just suspended in mud kind of, or settled there in mud. Flows through your BHA, no problem. Leave it alone. Get the top off because especially the faster you've been drilling, there could be enough thickness there that all of it together won't flow through your BHA. So get the top off, meaning circulate bottoms up. There's no one circulation, 10 circulation hog law. It's when your shakers are clean, you've removed everything that's gonna remove. Now, over time, you might find that's always, you know, two circulations, so fine if you wanna teach that, but teach your crew that when nothing's coming out, nothing's coming out. Also- <laughs> Pretty simple. Yeah, but, but, but not easy because we don't wanna wrap procedures that way. The engineers don't. So the other thing is that um, teach them that it does not mean your hole is clean. That hole right there, nothing's coming out, right? It is not clean. Uh, a third thing is that it doesn't mean you can trip if you have enlargement. If you didn't allow enlargement, that means that, man, you can you can trip. You can be confident. You watch for dragging pulls and all that, but you're not going to see any. You're just pulling through that lower bed. Okay. I mean, I've already used all my time up, so let's move on here. Um, Fred, you've got all the time in the world. Nobody's got birthday parties to go to. Nobody's got meetings to attend or anything like that. So you take all the time you need to, sir. Uh, we never know about that. So, uh, all right. The screen is back on. So I'll have a question while you're bringing this up. So as far as, you know, there's a lot of drilling tools out there where people will, you know, claim that, you know, our tool helps to be able to disturb bed cuttings and to be able to, to clean the hole, whether it's a stabilizer or a reamer, it's, you know, all these different kind of tools out there who that claim these kinds of things. Do these really have any effect then? I, I should have mentioned earlier that, you know, the, the cutting falls and hits bottom. We're talking about 10 feet. So if you were to stir this bed, you and you can do that. Stir is the wrong word. If you have a fat thing that you pull through the bed and the velocity around that fat thing goes up, your equilibrium bed height goes to zero, meaning you mobilize 100 percent of the cross-sectional area of the bed. Well, good. But it's going to fall out in 10 feet, possibly. Uh, depends on your flow rate and some other factors. Maybe it goes 15 feet. But what you're doing with those devices is is only affecting a small part of a 10,000 foot lateral. So we, we did. I've been involved in a little research with those. And what they tend to do is, um, number one, you are not needing hole cleaning help unless you allow enlarged hole. Work that. If you and so they're band-aids for the real problem, but they're not really good band-aids because they add so much ECD to a well that I could take that same ECD, put it in the mudway, and I wouldn't have a problem to start with. So I'm not I'm not uh, uh, there may be very unique situations where a bladed drill pipe or uh, a hole cleaning tool would help uh, maybe in a very large section we're trying to get in there and specifically work on and get some velocity within that section. But as a routine tool for drilling with, um, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, don't believe that's what, what you want to do. I think you want to raise your mud weight. So we, and, and even we if you something like this every 15 weight. feet, almost. I'm sorry. So we'd almost need one of these tools every 15 feet. If we well, and you have a, you already have a tool joint every 30 feet with the same OD as your drill collars, your velocity is going to go up around every tool joint. And that, and yet, you know, from experience that that still doesn't help us because it falls out so fast. You have a bed right above that tool joint almost instantly. So it, I'm uh, 15 feet is, I, I shouldn't have even said a number, but just to give it some frame of reference, you know, you, it's really, really quick. Thanks. Okay. So, 
So I'm 15 feet. It's a calculated measurement, so it's not just 15 feet. So, all right. Thank you, Fred. I'll let you. You've got the screen, sir. Okay. And they all add ECD. Use that ECD on mud weight, and you won't have a problem in the first place. And if your hole can't take mud weight because you lose returns, it can't take this ECD either. So I don't see the scenario. So if we look at the place where we get in trouble with the beds uh, in a gauge hole, if I were to have to trip and I couldn't circulate bottoms up, maybe I have a washout or something and I've been drilling fast and I have a high bed, it might not fit around my, around my stabilizers. Uh, that has happened you know, across my career so few times that um, uh, I think the tail is wagging the dog. To keep my bed continuously low enough to trip, I might be looking at 150 feet an hour instead of 500 feet an hour. And from a cost effectiveness standpoint, for something that rarely ever happens, I wouldn't worry about it. The problem we have most is enlarged hole when we trip and when the top of the collars or stabilizers drive this in. What you want to do as you drill is watch your shakers for cavings and document where your enlargements are. And I'll come back to that. If you know where they are, you give that to the driller before you trip and you say, when the top of the BHA arrives at these depths, get on your toes, folks. Watch for the pulls. Don't pull more than 30,000. Drop down. As soon as you see a pull, drop down. Engage the pumps really, really, really slowly, trying to get a little flow through here without pressure energizing this uh, while you rotate the pipe. And then when you do get flow, lo really, really slowly bike your way back into it because what you're trying to do is mobilize material at a rate that will still fit in the gauge hole above. Don't mobilize too much at one time. The way you do that is really, really slow movement of the top of your BHA through the enlargement. So in a perfect world, that's what we try to end up doing. Remember your rat hole, especially offshore where we leave so much rat hole. What I was simulating in that video was an eight and a half hole going to about a 12 and a quarter. Well, that's our rat hole. 12 and a quarter inch rat hole. If you leave, you know, 20 feet, you probably won't have a lot of trouble with it. But if, if for some reason you end up 80 to 100 feet off bottom, you could see, uh, and your flow rates and all that are, are kind of a marginal, you could see a lot of trouble getting your BHA up through the rat hole that you left um, because of the stored mass that's going to be in there, mobilizing into casing ID. And then, of course, up here, when you shut down in the avalanche zone, the cuttings fall and slide down. And we often think we're safe when we get into casing, but then we run into a pack off actually inside uh, somewhere between 40 and 60 degrees. So um, usually if you, if you feel like you, you know, haven't had enough flow rate, you've been losing returns or whatever, get inside your shoe, circulate bottoms up again and try to move this as far up here as you can uh, before you try to trip through it. Uh, and carry enough uh, 6 RPM or gel strength so you can inhibit the rate at which cuttings fall and go into this avalanching process. So what flow rates do we need? Well, they've been going up. Um, the more flow I have, the lower my transportable layer is, the smaller it is from an ROP standpoint. But in eight and a half hole, I, I would say, or all of these hole sizes, these are the minimums and I call the survival flow rates. You don't want to be below that, but you really would rather be in the upper ends of these ranges here. Most of our uh, modern, you know, uh, West Texas rigs are probably can do a thousand or eleven hundred gallons now. Um, seven hundred is not a problem, and all of the new offshore, uh, big offshore rigs have been built in the last few years. They're really being built for two thousand, twenty-five hundred gallons a minute uh, for these big holes that they drill. That's it's partly, I think, been recognition that in the offshore environment or if you have an environment where you can't easily carry the mud weight to maintain a gauge hole, the empirical experience has been that we can compensate with a lot of flow rate. And uh, that is something you can think about anywhere. If you if you're having hole instability, can you get more flow rate? Because if I'm cleaning a 12 and a quarter to an eight and a half, I can still clean it. I just need a lot more flow rate. It might be a redesign option in some cases. 
we've already talked about rotation. And so we come back and I just wanted to end with a couple of slides here on instability, uh, how that works. Uh, if, you, if your team doesn't understand how instability works, you get a lot of empirical kind of uh, concerns and you, you argue about raising mud weight. Uh, if, you, if you do teach your folks physically how it works, there's not a lot of argument left. So what happens when we get a hole, we cut a hole in this rock here, the rock is stressed and that stress is trying to squeeze the hole closed. Now it doesn't, it hardly moves, but it's trying to. And so there's, there's, a, whoop, there's a very slight reduction in the ID of the hole here. It's trying to squeeze the hole down. The rock is elastic, you know, not very much, but elastic enough that it's trying to squeeze and become smaller. So this solid red line here is the circumference. What it's trying to do is shorten that circumference when it squeezes the hole down. If I had a smaller ID, I'd have a shorter circumference. So what I end up doing is actually developing stress in this direction because of the stress coming in and pushing on the rock in this direction. I hope that makes sense. Um, this is called hoop stress. If all of this comes to equilibrium and all this moving stops, and we're talking about thousands of an inch of borehole wall movement, if all of that stops before the hoop stress exceeds rock strength, we have a perfectly stable hull. So if I have a 2000 PSI rock and all of this comes to equilibrium and that stress is only 1800 PSI at that moment in time, I'm good. But if that stress goes all the way to 2200 PSI and I have a 2000 PSI strength rock, it breaks and the borehole caves in. So it's all about this hoop stress acting in this direction, which comes from, you know, the stresses outside acting radially in, trying to squeeze the hole. Now, what I do then is push back. When I raise the mud weight, what I'm doing when I raise the mud weight over here is I'm expanding the hole, making the circumference longer. So I'm stretching the hoop back out so the hoop stress goes down. I don't need zero hoop stress. I just need it to be below rock strength. So maybe I add three tenths of a pound per gallon and now I'm down to 1800 PSI of hoop stress and I got 2000 pound rock and I got gauge hole. That's what mud weight does. It physically expands the hole to stretch the circumference to reduce the stress acting around circumferential or tangential stress around the hole from below rock strength. That's what it does. Okay. So there are no scenarios in which it does not do that. If I raise the mud weight, I will expand the hole. I will reduce the hoop stress. The uh, um, um, unconventionals we're drilling have relatively high strength rock. It's not 2,000. It's usually between 20, 10 and 15,000 in most of our, our really active fields right now. All of West Texas is, you know, 13 to 17,000 PSI. So I can stand a lot of hoop stress. And if I am a little bit higher than that, I just need a little bit of mud weight to do it in most cases. So if you contrast that to the extended reach offshore environment, this really is 2000 PSI rock. Still, I may just need a little bit of mud weight to put me on one side or the other. Whether I have high strength rock or low strength rock, that's not the whole equation. It's how strong is the rock, how much stress is there in there. And that's what really determines how much extra mud weight I'm going to need. Uh, the stress versus the strength. To get the stress, how much mud weight does it take to expand the hole enough to get the stress below the strength? And then I'm good to go. So that's really reliable. Um, now, you'll hear about fractured shells, you'll hear about unconsolidated sands, those are long stories. But even in those cases, if I raise the mud weight, I reduce the stress that's actually causing the enlargement problem. Okay, no such thing as an unconsolidated sand downhole. They all have some strength because they're under stress and it gives them strength. Um, fractured shells, if I have a fractured coming in here, when I raise the mud weight, I'm still pushing on the wall. I'm just looking at the aperture of a tiny fracture that's not even open. 
So I still push on the wall. I still expand the hole. I still reduce the stress trying to break the rock. There's not really a scenario. Uh, and I can do some things to make the mud more effective at pushing on the hole, borehole wall in, expand, in a ungazolated sand. I can do some things to make the mud more effective at pushing on the wall in a fractured shell so that I'm not simultaneously pressurizing the, the cracks as much, you know, put the Soltex in it or whatever. So I could do some other things, but the fundamental is still right and it's still what we need to do. So what is the major diagnostic? It's not a downhole PWD. That helps me manage pressures and identify problems. The diagnostic is what is on your shell shaker. We all need to establish caving surveillance processes or shaker surveillance where we watch what's on the shaker continuously and we look for broken rock, cavings, something that's not a cutting. Now, at high angle, we're going to have a lot of stress, what we call asymmetry on the sides. That makes it break easy. And what you get out of that is a splintery, not splintery, a triangular looking thing. See that ridge running down through here? If you're breaking out the sides of your holes, you're going to get that ridge running down of a triangular shaped piece of material. It's really literally that notch popping out of the side of the hole. And the other side of this is going to be curved. It's your borehole wall. The other side of that will be curved. If you see that, you need a little bit of mud weight, maybe 0.2 to 0.5 per gallon. If you see this, if, if you have really inadequate mud weight, it's going to start turning blocky and thick and squared off looking, maybe rounded if it's been tumbling around, but it's kind of blocky looking. That means you're, you've got so little mud weight or so inadequate mud weight, you're actually breaking the top of the hole, the side that has less stress to break it. Even that's breaking. You're going to need a half to a one pound per gallon. If you see this, your surveillance practice would be come in, talk to the rig supervisor, decide if, to raise it 0.2 or 0.5. If there's no reason not to, do it. When you start to understand all the effects of allowing that enlargement, do it. If you see that, your workflow should be that the rig supervisor is authorized to be raising mud weight before he calls the opposite. And you need to work through that in advance. If you've got any history of that or any doubts about it, because you can't fix enlargement and you're on the verge of losing this well right here. So this surveillance process is how we know we have an adequate mud weight or an, or, or an adequate mud weight. And if you don't have that surveillance process, if your mud logger is not doing it or you don't have a mud logger, um, you might want to do that for a while and make sure you really understand what your mud weight is doing currently in your program. In any new well or any extended reach well, you should always be doing this uh, or new area. Learn from what's on your shaker. Now, we can do models. We can do math. We can predict mud weights and all of that. But we do models as engineers to predict the likely outcome, not the real outcome. Uh, we model to create conditions, you know, that we think will work, but the reality is all, always trumps. And for whatever limited redesign process we design, you should always invent a field process for seeing whether or not it's working or not. And in this case, it's simply watch your shakers. No matter what your model said on stability, watch your shakers. If you never see a caving on your shaker, you have gauge hole and you should not be holding back on your ROP for concern for hole cleaning, no matter what everybody's always done. If you do see cavings on your shaker, you better talk about it. You might need to be holding back or as you drill faster, you really need to watch pressures and other indications that you may be having a problem. Secondly, you need to document everywhere you saw cavings and give that, hand that to the driller, put it on a mud log for tripping or something he can watch and see when the top of his bomb house assembly is approaching that section. And be careful. You get pull, you have a process, drop down, engage slowly, be real careful. Here we go. Uh, but use your documented record of enlargement in real operations and be set up so they know to do that. Post drill, use that documented record of enlargement and take pictures. Part of the process is you look at there, you take a picture and you keep that picture. That's part of your well record and the next picture and the next. So when the next engineer plans a well, they can go through these pictures and they can say, well, is it like this or was it like that? They're not saying, oh, we got stuck or we didn't get stuck. I can I can have this and not get stuck, but I sure need to be planning a higher mud weight for the next well. So 
huge, huge part of of managing, maximizing ROP for hole cleaning is literally knowing you have a gauge hole or not have a gauge hole. If I know I've got one because there are no cavings out there, I really behave differently than if I don't know I have one. Um, or if I know I don't have a gauge hole. So <clears throat> just a few more pictures here. These might be called splintery, but what you're really looking for here is this triangular shape. And you can actually see that within these cavings. This is a little bit of mud weight, something blocky means that you need a lot of mud weight. Okay. Uh, I won't repeat these, you know, we're kind of out of time, but I, you know, I think we've talked through this and you guys can download the presentation. Um, the, the real takeaway is that we don't really have hole cleaning problems per se, in the sense that hole cleaning with normal flow rates, normal fluid should never limit your ROP before something else does. And uh, you should be in the 500 foot per hour range and that should be an expectation in all of your footage unless it's stronger rock and you can't get the motor differential or you know some other limiter slows you down but if someone is saying i can't drill faster because of hole cleaning you should get really suspicious that what your real problem is is an enlargement and the answer is pretty simple and that's what i have there david Just jumping back over. Sorry, I was trying to answer a couple of questions. There's a, a lot of people, especially right there at the end, as far as the uh, looking at the shell shakers, looking at the cuttings across, um, that there was a lot of interest there, uh, a lot of people commenting and, and, and things. So, <clears throat> guys, I hope everybody has, has definitely enjoyed this class. So now this part, we're definitely going to 100% open this up to, to, to questions about uh, the presentation and if you have any other questions, but hopefully we can we can address the ones about the presentations first. Um, I did have a couple that that kind of came through during the show. Um, one of them, somebody's I can't I don't know if I copy and paste it onto my my uh, word document here, but they were asking about uh, sweeps and slugs. Um, so if you could address that. Uh, Fred. Uh, for the most part, they're band-aids. If you have a whole nourishment problem, raise the mud weight and, and you can quit that. Now, there are places where, you know, we're, we're going to redesign to the economic limit of redesign. We always say that. And uh, it's not always economic to, uh, it's not always the most economic thing to do. Let's take the wells out in, in the Delaware or the Midland Basins. We've got a lot of salt and anhydrite coming right out of the surface casing shoes. You're not going to keep that salt gauge. And so I could run an oil based mud, but then I've got lost returns. It's not economic to use that as a solution. So if you look at about any well out there, you're going to see 20 inch hole and a 12 and a quarter go to 20 inches in each salt and then come back to gauge with sharp ledges at every anhydrite. And there's, you know, maybe two or 3,000 feet of that in a lot of areas. So you're not going to put a gauge hole there. Um, if I so so there are situations where it's cheaper to sweep also if but, but on the other hand um, if it's instability related to mud weight and you can add the mud weight you know it's cheaper not to do that if you're depending on sweeps continually to live with an enlargement problem you're continually sitting there on the edge saying hope nothing goes wrong Hope I don't lose the pumps. I hope I don't. This doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. You're exposing yourself to things that you just don't really don't have to do that. Um, maybe in a certain situation, especially extended reach offshore wells, where the cost of something going wrong uh, is so high. Um, so sweeps at low angle might make sense. It's particularly a sweep where you're not sure if you have enlargement. You get to TD. You're getting ready to pull a hole and run casing. And pump a sweep, and it's really a check sweep to see if the hole's clean before you trip. When you do a sweep, make sure it's big, not small. Because if you do have anything that's large, the fall rate, the slip rate, even in the sweep, is going to be so high, it can fall out the bottom of your sweep before your sweep ever gets out of the hole. So try to get your sweeps maybe in the 200 to 300 foot tall range. It's not volume, it depends on the hole size. Get your sweeps taller 
and focus on gel strength in the sweep. And if you do have some enlargement, because you, you didn't have a practice of doing caves monitoring or whatever, um, uh, they, they'll, they'll definitely help you get a lot more of that material out of enlargement, reduce the odds of forming a bridge and being able, and improve the odds of being able to run casing. At high angle, no value whatsoever in sweeps. If you're using sweeps, you are really playing the band-aid game. Uh, you you really, really need to try to get the mud weight up. If that's too late and I let the borehole break now, I discover it, the sweep should be high, high mud weight. You know, you get an 18.5 range, whatever you can get to energize in that enlarged hole will float. It'll stay in your sweep until it gets vertical and then it might fall out the bottom again, but by then you're back engaged casing and you can get some velocity on it. So I do see value if I have a problem with a high weight sweep. I would not pump them unless I see an actual diagnostic indication of pressure spikes or something until I get ready to trip. And then I, again, I would treat it more as a diagnostic uh, uh, than I would a, um, a routine habit. Uh, the routine habit should be to run stability mud weight. Well, I'll tell you, you know, another, it's a little bit off the sweep subject, but, but the organization I work with reached the point where we actually went out and, and what we drill were extended reach high angle wells almost entirely uh, at that time, our organization um, didn't have the unconventionals happening yet. Uh, we actually launched a maximum mud weight program. Drill out your casing wow. shoe, do a leak off text, maximize your mud weight, raise your mud weight to whatever the borehole will stand in, in the, with the ECD that goes along with that. Maximize your mud weight, not minimize it. And it was profound. The effect was very profound. Uh, we call that, you know, we were sitting around a technical organization and we got called whenever we had problems. And we call that the Maytag gear. If you all remember those old Maytag commercials where the guys are sitting around because nobody's washing machines broken, the repairman just sitting there, you know, drinking coffee or something. Uh, when you're playing that ball game, extended reach, offshore, high angle, maximize your mud weight. Why not? Oh, we'll get differentially stuck. Well, we got a paper on that too. You you should have zero risk of differential sticking if you do all the right practices. Whatever the actual collateral issue is that you're saying that limits you from raising the mud weight, go redesign that, and now you can raise your mud weight because mud weight is the ball game. Stability is the ball game if you're offshore and extended reach. You can survive with inadequate mud weight, with those splintery things, with those triangular things on your shaker. Why? Why suffer all that pain? Most of those people in that environment really should be looking at managed pressure drilling as well, because they're mostly ECD driven in keeping their mud weight down. Excellent. Okay, so I know we've had, I mean, I, I'll say this first. We've had a ton of people commenting saying thank you so much for this, Red. They really do appreciate it. Uh, a lot of people are still in the comments, still a lot of people watching. We're still at about 155 people watching. Uh, I will say this to everybody that's watching. There is a time delay between the conversation that Fred and I are having and then with what you guys are seeing live out there on the Internet. So, like, if you guys ask a question and it takes a little while uh, for the feedback loop there, it's just because there is a time delay as far as, uh, internet lag and just the way that uh, live streams work. So uh, bear with us as, as we try to tackle as many of these questions as we can. So uh, somebody did have a question. I have a question for the Q&A. Does the amount of cavings matter in decision making? Let's say we have a splintery and angular cavings consistently, uh, but the amount is not increasing. So we're actually more about like a, a quantity thing. Well, you know, kind of with this model, what you're thinking here, it probably doesn't. Uh, it's not as important as some other things. Um, the The problem that we can have is 10 foot of enlargement, 20 foot of enlargement. Actually, if I had 200 foot of uniform enlargement, I would be better off than if I have 20 foot of, um, of enlargement in the middle of a gauge hole section. Because the physics are that I have this stored mass and I mobilize a bunch of it. If I've got a stored mass in a big hole and I mobilize it into a more big hole, nothing happens. Nothing really packs off. It can't pile up and touch the top of the hole, get pressure energized, develop effective stress, develop strength, and pack me off. It's got all that area, you know, to move in. 
where it, it's really the, the, the very top few feet, if I mobilize that into that small hole where I, I have most of my problems. So short sections are important. So if you're drilling, and this is why the caving surveillance is so important. If you're drilling along and you see cavings, you need to know exactly where they started and where they you stop getting them. Now, by definition, kind of. Now, if, if you, someone is saying, I'm going to watch the amount of cavings as I drill and see if they get worse. Well, wait a minute. Are all of those cavings coming out of the same 10 feet? Are they coming out of every new foot you drill? You don't know those things, probably. Am I getting a huge hole or am I getting slight enlargement the whole time I drill? And in either case, why aren't you raising your mud weight? If I've got a monitoring that says I've got someone out there actually recording this much cavings every day and you're not raising your mud weight. You know, the tail is it's kind of I'm doing what I was told and it feels good. And I'm being empirical because it's not as bad as the last well, but it's not really understanding the conditions that you might be creating and the consequences and how they really end up affecting constraints on ROP, trip times, ability to casing to bottom, all these things that are utterly unpredictable when you allow enlargement to occur. All right, Fred. So uh, I do want to mention this out to everybody that's watching. We still have a lot of people watching right now. Guys, this is going to be the like the part where you can really get the most value from this because we get to we're going to be addressing the exact questions that you guys have. So please tag somebody in the comments, bring them over to the, the live stream, let them know about this, let them get the opportunity here to be able to interact uh, live with with Fred. And like I said, we're going to until Fred tells me to shut up and it has to go eat lunch or something. We're going to keep asking him questions. Um, so. One question we did have was, what about uh, being able to use uh, acoustic well bore uh, measurement tools so that you can you can caliper the tools essentially as you're drilling? How much can that help in being able to mitigate issues in, in real time? Well, first of all, we're on the Hobbit diet. We eat all day. We <laughs> got breakfast and you know mid morning breakfast and. Uh, so I'm always ready to leave and go eat. So don't tempt me. Okay. Uh, I thought you meant like the amount of money we're spending on wells. So I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> the chat, the challenge with the acoustic tool, which is a great idea. Uh, and at one time Baker actually made one. It could be run up the string, uh, I believe, but the acoustic tools that we have inside our BHA, their problem is they're within 90 feet of the bit. Typically. So I've never made a connection. So we don't break our boreholes while we're drilling with ECD on the hole because that internal pressure is high. It's stretching the hole out. It's when we shut our pumps off, the internal pressure goes down, stress tries to squeeze the hole and the hoop stress goes up. That's when we break our boreholes. So if I'm seeing the borehole before I've ever made a connection, I've never actually, the rock's never seen the peak stress it's gonna see and it may not have ever broken. So we break during connections. Uh, so the solution to that is to run your in design, invent some kind of tool. You run about two, three stands up. So you've actually cycled the borehole a couple of times on two connections. Um, the option to that is to do a mad pass. For, and, you know, now you're talking rig time and politics and, you know, we don't want to do that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we need, we need a tool that can both be run about 300 feet up in the string and has the ability to communicate, you know, with the pulsing unit and all that. Um, and, oh, I know, let's run more pipe, but, you know. <laughs> Just be, be, be cautious about looking at those those old logs because there are probably all, or, or check the tool position, make sure it's not within 90 feet, and you'll find it almost always is. Excellent. Um, so we've had a couple of people make comments about back reaming. So if you would... So, so multiple questions in different formats, but the, the main word in there was back reaming. So there's several there's several um, hole cleaning uh, practices tied to that potentially. If we're drilling along um, and we need to trip for a bit motor, just circulate bottoms up till nothing comes out. Leave the equal run bed alone, trip to it. If you're at TD and you're going to run casing, you might want to make sure that there is no equilibrium bed left. Now, if you didn't have enough flow rate to maintain that all the time and, you know, 
circulate it down to zero bed height, then you're going to need to wash out a hole or maybe back ream out of hole. What happens when you do that is the velocity around your drill collars is so high that you will have a zero equilibrium bed height, meaning you will remove everything to the bottom of the hole. Uh, so that's a choice you you would need to make based, you know, have you had lost returns and you've been drilling at unusually low circulation rates? Be thoughtful about that. Um, you may have had a practice of not, not doing that, just tripping out and running casing, but understand the equilibrium bed process and the things that make that bed higher. And, you know, have you had any of those things going on? Did you see any cavings on your shaker, for example? Uh, Cause when you run, if you don't get that out and you run your shoe back in there, it may set down on that area. Um, so just un think through your whole process and your well and what's been going on. If you, um, uh, if you have an oil-based mud or a non-aqueous fluid, if you've got a NAF, and you leave any bed in there, the NAFs are all extremely inhibitive to cement. So be very careful with that. If you leave a, a half inch bed, the whole length of the lateral, and it still has NAF in it, yeah, you'll pump your spacer ahead of that, your water wetting spacer, it'll, but it only wets what it can touch. It may not wet what's inside your equilibrium bed, and now you've got this entire length of uh, of uh, of cement that may be inhibited and it may never set. I had a sword in the stone story. Uh, then Bench told me, uh, you know, took a piece of rebar, dipped it in some naff on a drilling rig, bucket of cement, stuck it in the bucket of cement, came back the next day and pulled it straight out. The naff just coating, just the film of naff on that rebar killed the cement set. So he could just pull it straight out of the bucket of cement. Um, Story kind of sticks with me. <laughs> so if you've got a NAF um, and you're not sure your equilibrium bed height is zero, then uh, uh, wash out a hole. Now, if if you want to know if your bed height is zero, circulate bottoms up as normal. And then on one well, wash out a hole and see if you get any more. And that's one way of figuring that out. You're going to drill lots of wells in a in conventional program anyway. Um, if I'm offshore and extended reach, I'm going to probably tend to circulate out unless I'm really sh wash or rotate, either one. But uh, use my BHA velocity to remove everything unless I'm really confident that I'm, I'm removing all the cuttings and have no bed height. Excellent. So one of the guys that's been very active, Fernando Lopez Gano, uh, has been asking about the stress cage. How about stress cage? I've never even heard that term before, so this is new to me. There are there are um, two concepts, two big buckets of concepts in altering the pressure integrity of the borehole. Um, one is in which means ch increasing the stress holding the hole closed. That's what LCM does, really. And that's a pretty long conversation and pretty contentious. Uh, people have a little bit different views on the physics of that still today. Uh, they're, they're all wrong except for me, of course. So uh, the one is that we, we actually, with LCM, uh, as the LCM goes in, it loses carrier fluid, becomes immobile. We pressure up against that once it's isolated the tip from our pressure and or, or the ECD does or some kind of pressure occurs, it widens the fracture. And we pack it with that increased width. We don't heal the fracture. We drive its width up. Hesitation squeezing can do that, blah, blah, blah. But if we widen the fracture, where does that volume of space come from? By elastically compressing the adjacent rock. If I elastically compress the adjacent rock, what happens to the hoop stress? which runs all the way around the hole. I'm literally jacking up the hoop stress by widening the fracture at one point, actually two points on either side of the hole. So I'm stressing the hoop and increasing the stress. So if I increase the hoop stress from 10 pounds per gallon to, you know, 12 pounds per gallon, I can run more mud weight or equivalent of that. So that's one idea. The other idea is that, and, and that's a pill idea, pump a discrete pill to do that. The stress cage idea is built on the same rock mechanics principle. We need fracture width 
to stress the adjacent rock. But in that concept, we carry those particles in our mud continuously. We don't wait and pump a pill after losses. So as I penetrate the zone, the fracture ha tries to happen, but those particles are sized and engineered to bridge the width needed to create the stress that stops the loss. So it's a sized engineered particle concept. So the particle bridges and it achieves the same thing in the end. It lets me do that continuously as I drill. Now there's field evidence that, you know, that, that has worked, but the confusing, there's some confusing elements of that uh, as well. But that, that is the confusing elements in the field data and what it's really doing. To do that, I need a very low fluid loss mud. So it, it's not a solution you would use everywhere. You basically have to have an oil-based mud. To do a pill treatment, that's always a high fluid loss mud and usually water-based. So they're really two different things. The stress cage thing has gotten morphed over time. It came out in 2004. BP kind of built that idea out and it had physics to it to start with. Today, it doesn't. Some people today just throw LCM in the mud and drill with it and call it stress caging. It's not a design particle size and all that. In most cases, it's actually a poor boy fracture closure stress squeeze where the fracture is propagating. It's a high fluid loss mud. It just naturally, whatever goes in the fracture runs out of water. It isolates the tip. ECD builds the width. We build the stress up and we keep drilling. So whether I have an actual FCS high fluid loss thing I'm doing accidentally or doing it on purpose, if we see the pressure change that we can put on a well, it's due to having changed the hoop stress. And so whether I'm doing this FCS squeeze deliberately or whether it's happening with my ECD pressure or something going on in the well accidentally, uh, it's still the same physics of how LCM works. The reason we can't do either in shell is that shell is impermeable. So my LCM goes in, my mug with LCM goes in, my pill with LCM, whatever I'm pumping, the water can't get out of my pill. So I can't dehydrate, I can't form the mobile mass, I can't isolate the tip, I can't put pressure to widen the fracture. So we don't have solutions for shell. We, we have really reliable FCS squeezes for permeable formations like sands. Uh, and we have continuous treatments like the stress cage concept that, that uh, have, have had really good success in favorable conditions. Um, neither works in a shell. Awesome. Uh, so the next one was, what about short trips advisable every five stands? Never. There we go. Why? I'm not the drill engineer. I'm not the one asking I'm, the question. I'm being, I'm being nasty here. <laughs> that's why. Uh, that's why. Just I haven't. Know that seen, I can't answer any of these questions. I really, honestly, haven't seen uh, anyone I've been involved with do a short trip in almost two decades. The, so the idea of a short short trip is to check the hole, but when we short trip, what we actually do is swab. If we do have borehole problems, they're because of enlargement and inadequate mud weight. When you short trip, what we tend to end up doing is swabbing and dropping the bottom hole pressure even more. And um, now the, the other concept is that the hole is closing on us. Shells swell and it closes on us. Whole other story, that doesn't happen. The closing I was talking about is thousandths of an inch, not the eighth inch gap on the bed or the stabilizers. This doesn't, this geom geometry movement is so small. We, we have been taught by words, swelling shells and all that, that, that's what's happening, but it's never ever what's happening. We have a vibrationally whirl induced spiral uh, or some kind of vibrationally induced pattern that's causing a geometry interference when we try to trip. Yeah, if it's small, we ream it off and we think, oh, well, it's swelling shell, we fix that. But the physics of hoop stress are such, and you, you can do the math and all that, that you um, you real quickly figure out that this idea of a shell and its properties actually swelling and grabbing us doesn't make any sense. A salt can do that, okay? Not, you know, 99% of what we drill all the time. Uh, in the organization I've worked with, 
all of them, I think, uh, have quit dreaming, quit short, short tripping because as soon as they understand what actually causes this interference fit with our stabilizers, um, where I retired from, as soon as we started managing world, ran longer gauge bits, uh, made the borehole patterning go away within um, uh, a year, virtually everybody quit reaming. Uh, and we were reaming offshore high angle extended reach and seven Darcy permeability. We were reaming two or three times before making a connection. And wow. in most cases, we went to no reaming. Uh, maybe some for filter cake management where we had really high perm sands and needed to condition the cake, but none in any of the shell intervals, which is most of your well. Excellent. We did get this. So as a mud logger, I typically tell someone when off, oh, people are asking questions. I tell someone uh, when I'm having uh, normal cuttings uh, are bigger than normal cuttings in my samples, especially the brittle shell, which can typically fall apart before the uh, big gets there to cause pack offs. What more can I do as a logger? So I'm so happy that, you know, I know mud loggers get, get um, pretty much the, the, the brunt of jokes out of there. It end up being the butt of jokes a lot in the oil field. But obviously through this, they do play a very important role. What do you think for them, something that they can do to be able to help um, elevate the awareness of what we kind of talked about today? Well, you know, we, we actually need to... Uh... Well, I tell you what, I've worked with some amazing mud loggers. Uh, just, ask, just tell them what you're trying to do and they'll figure it out. They have so much more knowledge about the actual structural morphology of the rocks versus the cutting. They can tell a cutting from the caving. And that's what's critical. Uh, your whole rig team needs to be taught. Get some pictures, work with your mud loggers, develop a little training manual on how to do the shaker surveillance and teach your whole crew how to recognize a caving from a cutting. Our, our cuttings uh, are from the bit and the bit fails to rock either in ductile or brittle failure, two different kinds of uh, products. The ductile failure is either gonna look like powder or these little long ribbons, uh, PDC looking ribbon. That is completely failed rock, totally reorganized. The long ribbons are only stuck together because they've extruded off the cutter face. They've re been reformed out of the rock off the cutter face, and they're kind of held together by differential pressure and little ions that, that have come out of the hole. Either powder on your shaker or those ribbon shapes, those are completely failed rock, and your mud logger understands that. They complain about PDCs. Always have. That's what they do often. So um, you, see, you tell that's not a caving. Uh, brittle failure does create little chips, but look at the pictures I provided and work with the mud logger. You can tell what the bit's creating from borehole instability. And it's not going to be that triangular shape and it's not going to be a blocky shape. It's going to be a little um, smaller thing. If they're seeing actually what they're calling, well, the other thing, stop calling everything cuttings, period. Call it shaker material in your language, whole routine. What's our shaker material look like? Well, it all looks like cuttings. Cuttings means it came from the bit. What's our shaker material look like? Now, I think we have about 20% cavings. And that's the kind of language and, and communication that we should have. If we just say cuttings, uh, we're not saying what's We're not alerting. We're not having a workflow. We're management, engineers, anybody are aware there's anything going wrong. Your documentation should be a picture and then a table that says percent uh, cuttings, percent cavings. And if the percent cavings is not zero, there should be a picture um, that you talk about or send to the office. Uh, we do need to fix our language around cuttings. And I think which is part of the question that you're asking there, when where they say we have cuttings, uh, I would call those, I would say, I don't know if you're talking about cavings or cuttings. If you're talking about cavings, um, you know, raise the mud weight, but. All right. Well then the next question actually kind of was on top of that. What do you need to look at towards your mud weight when running an eccentric rumor, helping break the cuttings or helping break the, uh, 
When, when running, I'm sorry, David, a what? Running a what? An eccentric reamer. Eastern? Eccentric. So e eccentric. eccentric reamer. Um, the, the, the PDC, probably PDC cutters on the eccentric reamer are still going to fail the rock in either ductile or brittle failure. They will not look like a caving. Okay. So that's the important thing is develop the little training manual, have pictures for examples, um, and and sort your language out on that. You'll real quickly see that you can't tell much difference between what the reamer is doing and the bit. You may literally see the curvature of the boral wall and some of those uh, intact uh, um, material, but the material itself, it's, if it's forming a ribbon, will be completely ex reorganized, extruded, granular material. And that's a, that's a cutting, not a caving. That would be interesting to see if there was a way to be able to detect the difference between those two to be able to see, you know, it, even if the eccentric reamer is actually really sending any material up to surface, if there was a way to be able to detect the difference between those two. So... Yeah, it would be it'd be tricky. You can imagine it depends on how much it's reaming. Is it cutting up a, you know, less than a diamond, less than a PDC diamond diameter? You get one thing. If it's more than a PDC diamond diameter, you might get an intact ribbon that looks just like a bit ribbon. So uh, it'd be it'd be interesting for sure. All right. Well, uh, let's say. Would you say that the bit type affects the whole cleaning in any way? You know, uh, we thought about doing research on that, and we kind of titled that designer cuttings. And that was something that, that I thought about for a while, and, and we tried to pay a little bit of attention to. But what we quickly realized is that um, if you have a gauge hole, it doesn't matter. Work your actual problem. Uh, if I generate a smaller uh, cutting, it's not clear that it travels much better in the actual extend uh, lateral it will definitely travel better in the vertical but not necessarily the lateral um, so that that's unclear uh, does it roll easier than a bigger thing with more cell area so you, you, it gets complicated um, but what i do know is that i drill faster by putting weight on bit and that's my my, my objective is not hole cleaning it's not a clean hole it's the dirtiest hole possible and I drill faster by putting more weight on bit. When you do that, the reason you're drilling faster, you're not turning faster. You're indenting the cutters greater, more greatly. So whatever you're getting, you're going to see actual bigger, deeper, wider cuttings. And I can't drill faster without generating bigger, deeper, wider cuttings. And so I don't want to be playing around with little things like that um, unless I'm really uh, have a really good reason to and what we say is if we manage our borehole and drill a gauge hole we don't really have a reason to play that game excellent all right so i've got one last question for you and then uh i do want to get from the audience for the those that are still watching with us we have still have about 100 people watching uh you guys give us some comments give us some feedback on what you guys would like to see in the future as far as this if there's other topics that we could address um Fred and I have already had the discussion that, you know, obviously this, we would consider this one to be a, a pretty big success. And if we can uh, continue doing this within the arrangements that he has with the university and with some of the other uh, operators and organizations that he works with, we'd love to be able to continue doing this. But you guys let us know, what are some of the topics that you would like to be able to see addressed? And if we can bring in a another uh, expert or, or another um, school or academic, academic uh, organization to be able to come in and, and educate us on some different things, let us know. Put it in the comments. Um, I will continue working on this during this whole current climate where we're all sitting from the house. If we can educate ourselves and become uh, more skillful in our approach to our work uh, or in our new job search, I would love to be able to help out with that. Uh, so please let us know your feedback. The feedback loop is what makes this thing work. So if nobody watches or nobody says anything, then I'm just going to keep doing the things I want to do. And I enjoy having conversations with Fred. So that would pretty much just be the end of it. We don't have to do it live. We can just talk on the phone. So uh, I want to switch gears a little bit since this was this question actually came in yesterday. 
So is, how do you see oil companies taking on digitization? For example, real-time analytics, automated directional drilling, et cetera. Operators creating their own, uh, are creating their main workflows in-house or hiring third-party companies to do it for them. Mm. Well, I don't see that doing anything but getting me in trouble. <laughs> so uh, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Fred. No, I, I would. I would really sort of like to. We're all staring at the ceiling, you know, at night, laying in bed, trying to figure this out. How do we create value, especially right now? Things that aren't creating value right now are at risk, and um, unfortunately, it, that means lots of visionary things and and philosophical things that might shape a better future. So uh, we all need to figure out how to create value right right now. And, and I think one thing that we can look at, um, our data analytics functions, whether they're independent or in-house, they are, uh, what you see is they're figuring the physics out because they have to. Uh, if they're gonna model, predict, be analytical, that at least some of them are doing that by understanding the physics more deeply. Some of the are doing are doing that by just doing pure stochastic method, which doesn't tell me why something happens. So philosophically, I think one thing that I would I would be concerned with is am, am I really figuring out how things work? Can I do some combination of building models that are more deterministic? so that I can actually tell the rig supervisor what to do differently, not just what to do based on the inadequate mud weight and enlarged hole that they had historically. You know, how do I look at statistics to know they need to raise the mud weight? So I need to come, I can look at statistics and say that this sets of data point to mud weight or point to enlarged hole maybe, but it doesn't tell me to raise the mud weight it necessarily, or it points to a hole cleaning problem. If I don't understand the physics, I don't raise the mud way. So our data analytics people, I, I, I think we need to move to a combination. We can use big data effectively, but it needs to be done within a, a deterministic physics-based framework. And I guess we get concerned about this in academics because the young people are coming in wanting to answer everything with big data without really understanding why the data says what it does. And, and you can actually operate that way in certain scenarios but you can't change and you can't improve and you can't create if you operate that way. All I can find is the midpoint of the past practices. Uh, the other thing is that if I'm in data analytics, automation or whatever, work closely with your operations people and ask them what limits you. Doing something with automation that I can already do with a trained driller doesn't add value. I'm gonna let that hang for a minute. If I ask you what limits you and they say, well, when I raise weight on, when I, when I do more weight on bit, I seem to have more motor failures and you go solve that problem. You just added value. You, I, I think generally we, we got really, really bright people um, in analytics. Uh, they understand vibrations or they're just building all kinds of knowledge. But we need to start with what actually limits somebody from putting weight on bit. If you do that and work backwards from that, you're going to create value and you're going to be recognized for that. So two things, you know, a little more deterministic and a little more starting at the end where the money's made. Excellent. So I've got uh, two questions that have come up here recently. Uh, it, and this is from Armin Federico. He's one of the guys that has continually watched the Vidor Locksmith show. So Armin, thank you so much for, for I don't, I don't want to call it a fan of the show, but participating in the live shows. Uh, so thank you, sir. I do appreciate it. Is it useful to run a bypass sub to help clean the hole at intervals or at TD? It, if you have an inadequate hydraulics in big hole, you see that done. Uh, you don't tend to see that done uh, in protective holes or production holes, you know, your TD holes, your smaller hole sizes. Um, the one exception to that I've seen is where, you know, you, a lot of extended reach wells set big casing and then they drill small hole, they tie back later to cover up the big casing. So I've got small hole below very big hole. And 
then I can, on top of that, have some constraint in my bottom assembly for flow rate. You know, some motors you can't put more than 800 gallons through, 1,000 gallons through, 900 is a pretty common number. So if, if I have a unique specific situation where I need more flow rate, um, probably for an upper hole section that's exposed, not the one I'm actually drilling, then you, you might you might see some of that happen. Uh, and, it, and it's it's a redesign uh, option. And you know, work with operations, make sure you understand a lot of the risks that are created in um, unusual conditions, not your normal drilling conditions, but well control and you know the usual things. Okay. Uh, I do want to say uh, before we ask this last question, uh, somebody made the comment about wanting to be able to do research with you. So I do want to be able to give you the chance to be able to plug the uh, the, the engineering school, Texas A&M, and, and what you guys are doing there at the school. So for anybody that's still watching that wants to be able to uh, continue their education or take the actual courses that you're, you're, you and Sam are teaching them there, I'll let you go ahead and mention that. We should have mentioned it at the very beginning, but I think a lot of people know. So we, we offer, uh, uh, we have a senior, stacked senior graduate class called High Performance Drilling. And we teach the physics of all the important performance limiters. And I uh, added up about 134 practices, you know, and it's quite, it's quite a good class. Uh, it, and we continually update it. At the same time, we work, we've work we been working with mostly independents in their field operations. So we're staying, uh, that class has stayed abreast of what people are doing to some degree. Uh, so that class is offered as a distance class uh, you sign up as a graduate, but you don't get any hours for it. You can be what we call a certificate student, um, and you can take the whole class online. There's a, you know, we're not having a pandemic. We have a class presence, and we have graduates, students who are online anyway. So we just tack on these certificate students, and, and we usually have a pretty good group of those. Um, uh, we've been doing that for for some years, and uh, and it's really helped us to. Uh, move ideas in the industry because those people who sign up as certificate students are injuring supervisors or directional drillers or people out doing work and it really really enhances the class so that's taught in the spring once a year um and it's, it's pretty good bit of workload but um there's probably nothing better that you could really get into uh as far as um uh research goes um we have four professors who have taught drilling and I'm not teaching classes anymore. Sam Nordert and I have worked together and he's taken over that high performance class. And he, um, uh, he and I work with these industry relationships and we, we're very in sync um, on the material. Sam being a full-time professor uh, actually coordinates all of our graduate work. And I would say contact Sam Parker, I mean, uh, Sam Nordert. N O Y A E R T, um, and, and you find him on the Texas A and M Petroleum uh, Engineering yeah. School's website. T A N U P E faculty, and just scroll around till you find him. All right, so we've got uh, we've still had tons of questions come in, but I'll fire off one last one for you, Fred. And thank you so much for being a part of this. What are your thoughts on working connections after a slide? Working connections after a slide. What do you mean by working? You mean reaming or uh, uh, up and down? I, I, I would I would believe it's just moving the pipe up and down, trying to get, I guess, any built up torque out of the string or, or trying to be able to, I guess, reduce any ledges that may have been um, happened when you're going from uh, uh, sliding to rotating. I, I, I'm, I'm making assumptions on that question. So, yeah, I, uh, I think you ask yourself what limits you if you need to and you see some value, do it. If you don't, if you don't prove there's value, improve weight transfer. It, after a slide, I'm going back to rotating, so I'm not really sure why you do it then. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't argue with somebody who's seen some value. Uh, I would question if I haven't seen an actual uh, problem or not, not problem, but if, if it doesn't make me money, if I'm not limited by something specific, then I wouldn't do really almost any practice generically. 
if I do see some advantage to that, I, I would try to go figure out why I'm seeing interference with my stabilizers. Is it a spiral pattern? I don't know how you get one of those sliding. Um, is it a, is it, a, am I drilling slick? If I would bet, and I would almost guess that they have a practice of drilling slick because I get really erratic uh, flexures out of that. I, if I put more weight on bed, it bends more and I get a higher bill. If I've stabilized, I have a fixed three point curvature. So I don't know if that's the problem, but I'm just using that as an example. If you see a problem picking up from a slide, then something unusual is going on, and I think. And uh, I try to figure out what it is. I would be a little suspicious of slick drilling. I think one of the good, you know, borehole patterning, why we see drag and those things might be a good subject for one of these sessions, but it's, it's a lot to talk about. Well, I'm always up for doing another session with you, Fred. Thank you so much for anybody that, that is out there watching. I know Fred's not a big guy on LinkedIn, uh, but he does get on there every once in a while. Go connect with him. Just, just go send him the connection request. If you guys haven't connected with me yet, go ahead and do that. Then anytime that I do go live, you should get a notification about it. Uh, as well, go ahead and send me a message about anything that you guys would like to be able to see in the future. I've already got three messages. I think there's a handful of connection requests, a whole bunch of comments. I'm going to go back through and read everything uh, from the session as well as I'm actually going to watch it and take notes since I don't get to do much learning during this because I'm working behind the scenes so much. Um, and, and then finally, uh, follow the hashtag Vidor Locksmith. Um, so that that way, any of the other content that we put out, you would you you do get the chance to see. Um, like I said before, we're just trying to be able to provide value. We don't have any sponsorships that go with this show. I'm not making any money off of it. Fred didn't get paid for this. I didn't pay Fred. Fred didn't pay me. We were just doing this to be able to help bring value to everybody out there in the industry. And hopefully you guys did get something to be able to take away from this. And more than anything, I would love to be able to do another one just on BHA World because I know that will cover tons of different things i don't know where we could piece that up and start and stop with it but i love those conversations because i think there's so much that uh, attacks uh, a lot of the myths that are taking place in the industry so fred thank you so much for joining us any last words i'll give it to you sir no th thank you so much david y'all y'all be safe out there Yes, sir. All right, guys. Thanks, Fred, for joining us. Uh, and as well, everybody out there that's watching, I really don't have anything else to say other than just give us some more feedback and know your industry.